This is Matt Hurt at Obsessive Viewer on Twitter. This is Tiny at Obsessive Tiny on the Twitters. And this is ObsessiveViewer.com's The Obsessive Viewer Podcast. I haven't thrown you in a while. I wanted to. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, welcome to The Obsessive Viewer. We're a weekly movie and TV podcast that covers a specific topic, be it genre, trope, movie, or show, each episode. You can find back episodes at ovpodcast.com and find the blog at obsessiveviewer.com and also check out the subreddit at r slash obsessiveviewer. And also, tiny, we didn't talk about this before recording, but uh, we're going to be at Starbase Indie. Yeah, we Here are. In a few weeks, yeah. Man, it's coming up. Yeah, it is. Like three weeks from today. Nice. Uh, for our listeners, we will be at, uh, come see us at Starbase Indie f- uh, for another summer movie preview panel. Uh, it's tentatively scheduled for 10 a.m. on Sunday, November 29th. Uh, the panel will be moderate- moderated once again by Starbase Indie's Mike George, uh, who you can hear moderating last year's panel on OV85. Um and again, that's that's November 29th. That's that's a tentative schedule on the website. Uh, they have a pocket schedule that you can download and check it out. Um, and also worth mentioning that on noon on that same day, a uh, friend of the show, Kate Chaplin, will be recording a live Kate's Take episode on Star Trek The Motion Picture. So, nice. Yeah. Uh, so for more information on Starbase Indie, go to starbaseindie.com. And we hope that we see you guys there. Um, that was a fun was time saying, last year. It was that conversation we had with uh, with Mike uh, mm-hmm. was, I mean, it was just fun. Like, I mean, it's oh, it's yeah. something that maybe like we should do more often. <laughs> right. I don't know because I mean we we talk about a lot of niche stuff sometimes, mm-hmm. um, and we we kind of uh, disregard the big or we don't disregard yeah. the big blockbuster stuff, but. It's fun to just sit down and just you know this is the yeah. big stuff coming up. I like I like the idea of um, uh, antip- anticipatory episodes and anticipatory uh, discussions like uh, yeah. like previews like you know uh, theorizing and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. We should we should definitely keep that in mind. Totes. Um, Totes. And Kate's awesome. Oh yeah, she's so awesome. That's, uh, yeah, people should come out for that. She's a, she's got a great personality for yes. for doing podcasting. And uh, come to that early so that you can come to our 10 a.m. panel. <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Uh, so speaking of niche topics, this isn't really a niche. Well, uh, we're today's t- for today's episode. We're doing something a little interesting. Uh, we're going to be discussing. Uh, well, in a bit, we're going to be reviewing the Leisure Class, which is. Um, uh, an HBO films movie that was, uh, the product of the latest season of project Greenlight um, on HBO. It just premiered on like November the 2nd or something like that. Okay. So as of this recording, it was a week ago and, uh, it came at the end of a season of project Greenlight, which showed, uh, the trials and tribulations of, uh, director Jason Mann, who was selected and who won the contest and was selected to direct uh, the movie, uh, which well, I'll actually get into that in a bit. Um, it's kind of interesting this episode because we've both we've both watched the Leisure Class, but I've watched uh, Project Greenlight. So we're going to what I'm hoping is that this will be an interesting discussion when we get to the review of the Leisure Class because I have the perspective of the season's worth of Project Greenlight um, in my brain before I watched. The leisure class and Tiny's going in pretty much blind. So yep, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. But first, I want to bring up uh, Project Greenlight just in general. Um, Tiny, you said off the air that you haven't watched any previous seasons of Project Greenlight, right? I have not. I've seen one of their movies, but that's it. Okay, and that's the Battle of Shaker Heights. Yes, which I liked very much. Nice. Yeah. Um, my history with uh, Project Greenlight is kind of. Not really interesting. It's not as involved as I want it to be. Um, for context, uh, Project Greenlight seasons one, two, and four are all on HBO Go slash HBO Now. Um, season three isn't on there because it's uh, it was on it moved to Bravo for that season. Huh. So okay, yeah. So I don't think that's available anywhere really. But quick rundown: uh, season one of Project Greenlight uh, was in two thousand one. Uh, 2001, 2002, and uh, the winner was writer-director Pete Jones, who wrote and directed uh, the script that they selected in the competition, which became Stolen Summer, which I think had uh, Kevin... Uh, um, Kevin, usual... Kevin Pollock? Kevin Pollock, there you go. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, so then season two moved on to... Uh, what they did was interesting. They they 
the contest was for a writer and director. So it was a first time, or I think it was a first time writer who wrote the Battle of Shaker Heights, and then the directors went and directed the movie. Uh, and then season three, um, I had the writers uh, Marcus Dunst, uh, Dunstan and Patrick Melton, who I believe went on to do like the Collector and the Collection and oh, uh, cool. Saws four through like six or seven. Damn. However many there are, I'm not sure. And director John Gulliger, they directed and th- they made Feast, which actually had some success, I think, and actually had some straight to DVD sequels stuff like that. Oh, okay. So that's a history of Project Greenlight. I, I really, I, I've only watched season two um, w- with the Battle of Shaker Heights, and I remember specifically that that was back in like 2002, 2003, and that was like when I was. How old were we? We were like fifteen. Yeah, like fifteen. That yeah. was like when we first like like w- w- the internet was new to me. <laughs> we started at, uh, we started refining our tastes as it, as movie film, it, movie buffs and stuff. Exactly, and yeah. that's why I really liked watching Project Greenlight because that kind of it was a peek behind the curtain. And I remember specifically like seeing the con- the first episode and seeing the contest winners, and then seeing that um, the Battle of Shaker Heights one. And like I went online and I. <laughs> I actually downloaded the script because uh, I think they had it online, like through HBO or whatever, or they might it might have just been like a a, a site that had that had the scripts available. Um, but I, I downloaded the script and actually read it from beginning to end, and then watched the rest of the season, and then watched the movie, um, and that was a really interesting experience. Yeah, um, and the movie was pretty good. Um, We've talked about it before um, at some point, but um, but for this season of Project Greenlight, they only picked a director. It was interesting because for the the executive producers, some of the executive producers on the project were the Farrelly brothers, and what they did was they had they had filmmakers bring in short films or submit short films, and then they called that down to like ten or fifteen finalists and then they decided on the winner which ended up being Jason Mann and um I'll just really briefly touch on some of the short films that the, that they had cuz they're all available online. I'll put a link in the show notes to a to a um a link to a slash film um uh, article that com- uh, compiles all the all the uh, um all the shorts and everything. But I watched four of them. Or actually I watched five of them. Um and there's some, there were some interesting ones. This one called Less Than Zero by Arturo uh, Perez mm-hmm. was, <laughs> it was fantastic. It was kind of like a, um, a, it was kind of like tailored to my interests because it was just a, basically a guy talking to a woman who he's seeing and, um, basically doing the math of how, how, uh, how small the number of men in the city that they're in. Um, are compatible with her to be her soulmate, basically. Wow. And it kind of, it's intercut between scenes of them, of their relationship. And it's really, it's really well done. Hmm. Um, that's probably my favorite of the ones I saw. Um, but not the one that really probably deserved to win because it didn't, because they, that was interesting. I'll talk about this when I get to the actual Project Greenlight, but they were, the, the project was a Fairly Brothers, um, produced script by a, a writer who I'll talk about here in a bit. Um, that was a broad, a really broad comedy. Um, so I don't think that judging from that short film that that would have fit there. But anyway, the other short right. films I watched were, uh, where do you want to eat? Which was just kind of okay. Um, by Ashley Barnhill. And they, she had a, uh, co-director there that it was kind of a weird bit in the show. I don't know, but, uh, living with jigsaw was probably my favorite by, hmm. by this guy, Chris Kappel. Did you watch that tiny? I didn't, but I, okay. I, I watched like half the first episode of project green light. Oh yeah. And they put in snippets of the, um, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the shorts. And I was like, I really want to see these. Yeah. It's fantastic. And they're like all available on like you, uh, YouTube and, and on the project green light Facebook page and all that stuff. Um, but it's, 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 it's really funny. It's about a guy who lives with, uh, Lives with like the uh, the jigsaw puppet from Saw. Yeah. So it's like basically the the scenes that they showed in the in the uh, in the TV show were um were like him saying like uh, like jigsaw saying hey I, I can't remember the name he's like hey Gary I put I put the keys in <laughs> I put your car keys in in uh, your dog and now you need to you need to cut them open with the, any of these uh, utensils from this drawer. If you want to, if you want to get to work on time, <laughs> Jesus. And then the guy just sits down at the table and just exhales. Um, <laughs> but anyway, then the other, the other short film I saw was Beanie Bros, which was pretty funny. It's by this guy, Adri- uh, uh, Adri- uh, wow, Adriano, 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 uh, Valentini. Uh, it's about a group of guys 
getting ready to go out for the night who they they're all wearing beanies and they're trying <laughs> that to decide. That looks so funny to it me. It was really funny. <laughs> and they're all trying to like decide who gets to wear the who gets to wear a beanie and who who doesn't. It's it's really silly, but anyway. Nice. So that, those were the shorts that I saw and then also the winning short was by Jason Mann who he made a short called Delicacy which it's it's kind of weird, and I'll I'll actually get into my uh, review of the show, but it's kind of weird because they were from the outset they were setting up that they were going to make this broad comedy, and in the in the first episode of Project Greenlight they said that the broad comedy was uh, uh, written by Pete Jones who won the first season of Project Greenlight, um, and it was about a guy who gets uh, uh, stood up for mar- stood uh, stood up on the day of his marriage and then marries a prostitute. And so, so the winning, the winning short film was by Jason Mann. It was called Delicacy. It's, it's just this really weird, but well, well made, uh, short film about this guy who is at a restaurant and, uh, the waiter brings him an exotic piece of meat. And it, it, from there, it's, it's a very strange, it's very strange. It's like, it, it, it's weird that that, got selected as the winner because that is not in keeping with the broad comedy that they had set up in the, in the, in the script. And that makes me call into question some of the stuff about Project Greenlight. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so after the short, fo- after the short finalists, they each were given, they were each given a thousand dollars and they were, uh, and, and a month to direct one, uh, one scene that was written by the Fairley, bro- uh, Fairley brothers, uh, uh, revolving around speed dating. Um, and I watched a few of those. I watched, uh, Jason Mann's, which which one obviously um it's dark and it kind of concentrates on an intense loneliness of the mm-hmm. characters and the world of speed dating and that it was it was funny it was it was unique it was interesting um and then i watched chris Cappell's uh take on it which was probably my favorite cuz it was uh the male lead was just so quirky and, and it really depended on him um and then finally i watched arturo perez's who's the one that r- made a uh, less than one in the previous segment that i talked about but um his was interesting because instead of having like it's a group of guys that are going on speed dating and instead of it kind of sub- subverted the expectations because it was just old men going <laughs> and it was really interesting <laughs> that's funny yeah um so anyway, so so let's get into actually talking about Project Greenlight. I'll uh I'll I'll run with it there. <laughs> I actually have a question. Oh, it, go ahead. Are uh are Ben Affleck and Matt Damon have they been involved with every season? Like uh, are they are they like actually involved with making the decisions like on the show and everything? Not really. It's it's okay. interesting. Like um I got the sense in season in in this season that they're basically kind of they're they're executive producers. So they're not like the they're not like the the head producers of it, like, like Effie right. Brown was in this, in this season, but mm-hmm. they're like kind of consultants and they're kind of brought in whenever they're not filming Born or Batman. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was kind of funny because whenever, and they pop up pretty frequently throughout the, throughout the season. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was, it was pretty interesting. <laughs> it was funny because people were like, uh, like when Ben, Ben Affleck came in there, <laughs> uh, what was it? Um, I can't remember what I can't remember what it was, but it was like, oh yeah, you. Look, oh, uh, uh, he was. Uh, they were like, wow, wow, Ben, you look really buff and really beefed up. And then he's like, yeah, I had to get in shape for the sh- for the Project Greenlight. <laughs> it's like that's that's pretty funny. Nice. Um, but yeah, so they, so they kind of they don't have like hands on on the production or anything like that, but they okay. have they they they're brought in like they there are times in the season that they um are brought in to consult on it and stuff like that. Gotcha. And kind of guide. Uh, the director and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't speak to the previous seasons. I'm not even sure if they were involved with season three because it went to Bravo. Um, right. Okay. They may have been, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so what I found interesting about it, about project Greenlight, was I, I kind of, a few things. There was, um, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A staunch, uh, non-supporter of reality television. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. And, and what's interesting about Project Greenlight, the reason that I give it a pass is that it gets a, a it, it's tailored to something that's really interesting to me, obviously, filmmaking and all that. Um, and I kind of get the sense that there's some doctored and, and there's some, there's some kind of, um, it, it was hard to tell whether what, like, what was fabricated for the, for the show and what wasn't, mm-hmm. um, because there were some things that it wasn't at that pronounced as, as you would think, that, think it was, but there were a couple things that kind of felt like, kind of felt like they were, 
they were kind of maybe making more of a big point on it. Like, um, I think spoiler for the first season or the first episode of the season, but, uh, the second that they announced that Jason Mann won, like he, like he immediately, like he immediately started making demands. Like he said, Mm -hmm. like he, like he said that he, uh, uh, he, he said that he, he's like, I want to shoot it on film. And he said that he wants to get rid of the writer and get someone else. The guy who wrote boys don't cry. Um, it's random. Yeah, which is very strange. Because that movie was hilarious, right? Right. <laughs> um, and it was just kind of, it was kind of strange, and it kind of felt like, like, okay, they've built up this character, this, this, this guy, the director, mm-hmm. as being a guy who's unconventional and, and doesn't, and he kind of has a dark sensibility and stuff like that, which makes me think, like, why the hell did they pick him in the yeah. first place? Like, why that? Which leads into the second episode in which. Uh, there's a conversation between him and the writer, Pete Jones, who won the first season of Project Greenlight, um, that they kind of, <laughs> uh, and maybe this is blowback from the diversity issue thing, which we can talk about here in a bit, but, um, so he's talking, he's talking to the writer and he's like, Hey, you know, I made this short film called The Leisure Class. Um, it, it wouldn't, and I had, I wrote it into a feature. Um, we can take that instead of this, of the script and do that. And like, it's, it's so weird in the editing because it's like Pete Jones, like, looks like, like, what the hell are you talking about, man? Like, mm-hmm. really? Like, he looks like visibly, like, just annoyed by it. And then the next, like, scene, they're having a meeting with, with, like, HBO and with, with the producer and stuff like that. And then Pete Jones just completely switches it and he's like, yeah, I read it last night and it's really good. We should really do this. So hmm. I, like the way that it all, the way that it all happens, it makes me wonder if they, if they kind of went into it with the, with the expectation like, okay, well, we have this, we have this script about, uh, that the Fairleys helped write or, or that Pete Jones wrote with the Fairleys and, and all that stuff. Uh, let's just have that be the script for the contest. And then I don't know. It kind of, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm jaded and cynical, but it kind of feels like they were saying that um, they were like they kind of conceived that okay, Jason uh, Jason's gonna win win the contest, and then we'll just make his movie instead of this one. Like maybe that was part of the yeah part of the build up to it. I don't know. It's that's all conjecture. Uh, conjecture. It sounds scripted. Yeah, like yeah. Someone came up with it. Yeah, yeah. And like the original script title even was was not another pretty woman, <laughs> which just seems I don't know, but. Anyway, so so the season overall was was actually really good. Um Effie Brown. Uh she was the producer of the movie. Yeah. And uh I had a really interesting perspective of her that that shifted around a lot. Mm-hmm. Um it was very highly publicized about the diversity issue that happened in the first episode. Did you get to that point? I was? did not. Okay. So it was really blown out of proportion yeah and i can't I, and okay i'm i'm a 29 year old white guy um, yeah. so i can't speak like i can't like take the i i, I don't know i don't i don't know it, it's an awkward thing to bring up but basically the thing was that in the original script not another not another pretty woman um the soul the the only uh, uh, uh minority character was a prostitute who, as Effie Brown pointed out in in the episode, gets hit by her white pimp. Mm-hmm. So, so like that was a very big like sticking point with her, and like it was a really weird, a really weird scene in the in the documentary because it was basically she was saying that um, they were they were trying to pick out or trying to figure out who who to pick for the who to pick to win basically out of the finalists, and she kind of said that um, I think we should really consider uh someone with some diversity to the project because my main concern is that the only that the only minority character in the script is a black woman who is a prostitute and gets hit by her white pimp which is a totally valid yeah valid completely mm-hmm. um and then Matt Damon's just like he's he all he said was that uh he points out that the only director of the of the ones that they have left is a pair uh, is a is a uh, directing team who also happen to be like, like they, they're the only diverse ones out of, out of the finalists, which maybe that's a problem in and of itself. Mm-hmm. But he was making the point that those two directors, um, were 
also the only ones out of all of their interviewing with the other ones who didn't have a problem with, with, uh, the way the script was written. Mm-hmm. And, like everyone else had it like immediately said like, Oh, I have a problem with this, uh, uh, with this aspect of the, of the script and everything. And then like a big point of, uh, picking a director is to, uh, not have just a guy or a, a man or woman who's just going to be like, uh, just going to be like, okay, we'll just shoot it as it as is. They, they want a collaborative process and everything. Right, yeah. Yeah. So he said, we cast diversity in the movie, not in the show. And hmm. that, like, got a, such a, like, like a gaspy response from Effie Brown. And I was like, and then from there, it was, it was spun on the internet as Matt Damon interrupts black woman to, t- to tell her about diversity. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, uh, he kind of had a good point in yeah. context. Like, right. I mean, I get it, but it's also like he, I don't know. It, it's such a, such, it felt like such a knee jerk, like internet reaction mm-hmm. to it. And it was such a, like taken out of context. I, I, yeah. it bugged me. It bugged me. Like most things on the internet, you need to read the whole thing. You need to read the whole article or not just look at the right. headline or you need to see the entire episode. Or, yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those classic things. People don't have attention spans anymore. And so they, they put in five seconds of something and you feel like you get the whole story and you really don't. Right. Right. That's what it's and, not that I saw it or anything. I don't yeah. really, I know nothing about it, but based on what you're saying, that's what it sounds like. Right. Right. Tiny's wearing a, a Nazi swastika shirt. That's weird. Um, no. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not. There's a skull on there. Oh, that's your is, Days of the Dead shirt. It's my Days of the Dead shirt. Nice. Yeah. Huh. Anyway, um, so yeah, so we won't harp on that anymore. There's, I'll put links in the show notes to articles about it and stuff. It's unfortunate. Um, it is. It's kind of, I don't know. In it, it just kind of, it just kind of bugged me. But anyway, um, so, so there was a lot of a big sticking point in the in the show, though, as it went on. That like, uh, Jason Mann was a very interesting director for this. Uh, he seemed really adamant about his. I, I kind of went back and forth. Like he insisted from the beginning. Like he's like, I want to shoot this on film, no matter what. I want to shoot this on film. But it was like like the producer Effie was telling him like we like that's going to cost like an extra $300,000 Jeez, out of, and it's a $3 million budget and they didn't have, like they just didn't have the money. He ended up having to, Oh, that's a spoiler. So, um, he insisted on, he insisted so much on shooting on film. And the whole time I'm thinking like, dude, you are on an accelerated, an accelerated time frame. Uh, just shoot it digitally. Like just, it it would be so much easier. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, like as it went on, like there were there are scenes where, um, particularly one scene later in the season where uh, Ben Affleck is talking to Len Amato, who is the president of HBO Films, I think, or maybe HBO itself. Um, but he's like the big boss of of the of the show, and he like they were talking about it, and it kind of really put it into context for me because Jason is a director who sticks to he has a very specific vision, mm-hmm. and he sticks to that vision, and he. He like fights tooth and nail for to to get what he wants from it, and that kind of like in the in the uh, film versus digital thing, like he like he he won that battle. Spoiler alert: it was shot on film, and uh, it, but then on other ones he gets like it causes some problems, and it's really interesting to see those problems like play out. Like he uh, like they they struggled really hard to find a location and uh mm-hmm. and that had some ramifications it's really interesting it, it go if if you have inter- any interest in it check out project green it's on hbo go and hbo now but um it was interesting and and effie also like she she was a very big personality like i mm-hmm. i kind of wonder if that was intentional for the sake of drama in the documentary or if they were, or if she's just, if that's the kind of personality that she needs to have to be a producer in Hollywood. But it was very off putting. Um, but like there, like there's a problem in post-production during the show about, um, the, the woman character and Fiona in, in, in the, uh, in the movie. Mm -hmm. And like, she expresses her concern over it. And by that point I'm just like, Oh my God, just give it a rest. Like you're way too, like it's, it's in her demeanor. Like she's too, aggressive aggressively something like there and then there's another there's another point i can't i feel like i can't speak to this without being uh i mean it's i don't know i don't know it like she made a big a big deal about having uh 
having a, a, any people of color in a servant role in, in the movie, mm-hmm. like cast in a servant role. So I was like, and that makes perfect sense because the movie yeah. is about like upper class people and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. she doesn't want to see them. Uh, she doesn't want to see minorities in a, in a servant role in it. Like, because right. that's casting that that's playing up stereotypes and tropes, even if it's a little bit, I can respect that and everything. Yeah. But she saw like one person, like a, a black man who was, uh, cast a, he, he, he was just a driver. Um, mm-hmm. and he, and he was like, he has like one scene where he drops someone off at the house and like, she was like, no, I'm not going to like, she was very aggressive about that. And all I thought was like, okay, like we only see that side of it. And I'm just thinking like, maybe this guy's really excited to be in a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I don't. <laughs> and so I, I mean, we don't get any more of it, but I'm just like, I just imagine like, okay, what if this guy's like really excited to be in this movie? And then his, 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 his role is completely cut or his, he's, his job is taken away from him because he, because of this controversy that she, uh, uh, brought up. It was just really, I don't know. And that's, that's such a, that's frustrating. It I is. Mean. And it, I can't like, we can't, I, we can't talk about it in full because I don't know the full context of it. I didn't see like any yeah. fallout from it or anything, but I don't know. So stuff like that just kind of bugged me and it seemed a little much, I, I guess. Um, hmm. But yeah, so anyway, so that that's Project Greenlight season four. It's on HBO Go and HBO Now. Um, I really enjoyed it, and man, just watching this made me because they HBO Go and HBO Now have uh, seasons one and two on there. So I'm like, I'm I'm ready to go back and watch the first two seasons because I was really into it. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I want to watch it definitely next time they come back. Um, I just I love the concept too, just the idea of what they do. I mean, it's amazing. Think about how many throughout human history, how many artists who were you know there could be some you know uh picassos out there and there could Mm. be some scorsese's out there who just never get a chance yeah and and i think i I like to think that maybe a project like this could find one of those kinds of artists and put a spotlight on them and give them a chance to really shine um and, and this show has that potential. So just yeah. just the concept of it, I I'm so behind it and think it's a really great idea. Yeah, and uh <laughs> and <laughs> this is this is uh I I I'll preface this by saying I did enjoy Battle Shaker Heights, but um I haven't rewatched it since I saw it, so you know, take this with a grain of salt, but I was uh my immediate reaction to that or my response to that tiny is to say maybe someday they'll make a good movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I kind of agree. <laughs> yeah, which that can lead us into our review of the Leisure Class. Yes. Um, the plot description for the Leisure Class, according to HBO, is a charming con man's scheme to marry a wealthy socialite come uh, comes unraveled when his wild and unpredictable brother arrives on the night before the wedding. Uh, directed by Project Greenlight season four winner Jason Mann, the film stars Ed Weeks as the sneaky William Rooney who desperately tries to keep the ruse and his real identity under wraps over the course of one crazy evening. So tiny, I've been talking a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, what did you think of the leisure class? Uh, I did not like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are definitely some good things about it. Um, I thought all of the acting was really good. Nice. I, I, I thought the, the, the main character, Ed Weeks, uh, playing William slash Charles, uh, he was good. He had that very, um, that very debonair, posh Englishman thing down very well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, his brother was, again, pretty good. Uh, Tom Bell, the, the actor playing Leonard, um, slash Dean was, uh, was the fun, super eccentric, sporadic, crazy brother. Um, he played that part relatively well. Um, for me, the standout was Bruce Davison as the senator. <laughs> um, he, gosh, I just loved his progression throughout the movie. Um, there's a part where he gets drunk and things come to a head. Uh, I just, I loved his performance throughout all that. I, he's, he's a well seasoned actor who's mm-hmm. been in tons of things, uh, a character actor, um, which I'm a big fan of. Um, he, he just, he was just fantastic. Um, and then there's this whole other, the whole other female side of this movie. The, there's the three sisters, including the, the oldest who's getting married, mm-hmm. um, and the wife. Um, everybody just, I think, really nailed their performances. Um, so I was really pleased by that. Um, there was some genuinely funny comedy. I really liked, um, 
I, I liked uh, some of the the very uh, the, the witty British humor. That's like the mm-hmm. the witty banter back and forth between the two brothers. They're trying to <laughs> they're trying to you know hold, uphold this ruse they're perpetrating, while at the same time kind of putting each other down and like poking fun at each other for the ridiculous thing they're doing. Right. <laughs> um, I thought that was funny. Um, it, it got pretty old pretty quick, but uh, it, it was. Again, I think it was uh, demonstrative of the the quality acting of these these actors involved in the movie. Um, that was good. There was some, God, there was some really good situational comedy. Uh, like I said, that everything comes to a head, and there's about to be violence, and there's just this prostitute who just raises her hand. She's like, "Can I say? <laughs> I'm so glad we're being all honest with each other and everything." Like, <laughs> I laughed really hard when that happened. Um, there's there's some examples of some quality comedy uh, uh, throughout the movie, mm-hmm. um, and it looked pretty good. I, I, I enjoyed the some of the camera work was was kind of clever. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing amazing, but I, I appreciated some of it. The uh, you could tell there was definitely like a filter on it, some kind of color palette that the director was going for. Yeah. Did you think the lighting was kind of off? In it the it was. Okay. I agree. It was. Yeah. Um, so, but, it, but it's still something I noticed and, uh, appreciated to an extent. Mm. Um, but that, that's really all the positive things I can say about it. Right. Um, maybe it sounds like a lot, but, um, I, I really did not like the, the erratic, um, the erratic nature of the storytelling. Mm. Um, you just jump right into the story and I feel like there's a lot of details that are just kind of, just kind of hang there and you can't really yeah. pick up what they're putting down. Like it's just, they don't, not that, you know, you have to hit everything directly on the nose and, and just, just tell us what's going on. But like, I, I had no idea he was a con man. Yeah. Like, until I read the synopsis after I watched the movie, I was like, <laughs> Oh, he was a con man. I thought he was Okay. Um, I thought he was just trying to get himself into a job or mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, he did say he was trying to get some money from him, but I, I don't know. I thought it was, I, I thought it was through legitimate means. He was just trying to get money from his organization or whatever. I don't know. There's like, there's one scene where after, uh, after, after, uh, uh, Leonard, the, the brother, uh, comes in where they're, they're in, they're in like uh, a room. Like he, he rushes them into a private room and he's basically, it's an exposition dump of like, yeah, I've been working to do this and all that. And I was like, that's it's, it's not, it wasn't built up properly. It was just basically like, yeah, this is the story that we should have spent the first five or 10 minutes of, of the movie telling you, mm-hmm. uh, or showing you rather we're going to just dump it here instead. Right. I, I felt like that didn't fit. Yeah. That well. I, I didn't, I mean, it, it just was not, clear at all i knew he was obviously doing something dishonest right but i didn't realize he was a con man full on i thought he was just trying to like kind of weasel his way into a job or something I, right i don't know it was just unclear um and uh that kind of erratic filmmaking and storytelling just just permeated the entire movie and mm. I, I thought it was just not conducive to good storytelling i i, I think it, it was weird that such a unique filmmaker had had this such a such a unique style mm-hmm. he would choose such a formulaic story yeah because i mean this is just a class you know my wacky brother shows up to my wedding that's right. like i mean that's like uh, that, that that's i've seen i feel like i've seen that before yeah even though i mean i don't know that's the plot of the adam sandler movie basically <laughs> um what was that one where he's uh, uh that's my boy that's my boy yeah. yeah i mean that's basically the same thing it's a little yeah, different details. It but. reminded me of like in my best in, friend's wedding. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, wedding crashers a little bit. Wedding, yeah. Like it felt, it felt like that, but with like British con men, right? And not really that clear. No, um, not at all. It was, yeah. So I, I feel like, I, I feel like th- this guy should not have made this movie. I mean, right. it, it doesn't seem like it's his kind of movie. Uh, I didn't, I didn't see. Uh, delicacy. That's his short, right? Yeah. I didn't see delicacy, but based on the little snippets I saw of it, it mm-hmm. seemed very quirky and very, uh, very unique. Yeah. Um, and and and, and super stylistic to his set of eccentricities mm-hmm. as a filmmaker, and that's great. You know, he needs to be. I think it's good when a uh, writer, director, filmmaker just completely creates their own story and writes the script and directs and produces it. That's great. But 
And this was his script, right? He came up with the story? It was. Uh, I, well, I think that – I don't think he wrote the short that it was based on, but I okay. think he adapted it into the feature. And then he and Pete Jones uh, worked together to re- revise it and stuff. So he's okay. actually a co-writer for it basically. Gotcha. Um, it just doesn't seem like his kind of story. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know why he would choose a story like this. Um, and, and that's that's speaking from – very little exposure to him, but right. uh, I think it kind of tells you how obvious it is that he should not have made this movie. Yeah. He needs to do something else. Um, I, I don't know. I really didn't. Uh, I, I really did not feel like his style meshed with the story at all. Um, Absolutely, and it, it was uh, that again goes back to just it, it felt weird that like he was chosen for this project from from Project Greenlight, and then. When, when, like the original script, he would not have fit to direct it, judging from his style of, mm-hmm. of the short films that I saw, um, through Project Greenlight. And then he brought in the script and it doesn't even really feel like his, his script. I mean, it's out of left field, really. Sort of, but, and maybe we're being a little reductive of it because it is kind of, it is kind of to his taste. Cause like if you see Delicacy, it's, it's a really, and he says this in Project Greenlight, but he he uh, is a fan of um, I forget the way that he phrased it, but it was just basically uh, meshing meshing genres a little bit and kind of kind of leading into a different like darker tone. So it's like like in the Leisure Class starts at, like starts out as a kind of broad comedy, mm-hmm. um, and then just kind of slowly gets to a point where it's it's very dark and very uh, um, like a like dark humor in the in the yeah. basement scenes particularly mm, yeah um which but, I I really like that whole scene that was yeah, me great too. Yeah. yeah I'll give yeah. him props for that um I will say that the prostitute um <laughs> yeah she pops up out of nowhere yeah she and it's it felt it's she did not fit in the movie very at all. forced yeah very forced and and yeah. it completely dropped the what was building up between or what was what was established between um uh, uh Leonard and uh the sister. Uh, the younger sister. Yeah. Like there was like, they, they basically hinted at like, oh, they're going to have something there. Right. And then it was just gone. And then a prostitute's there for comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, though I did like that scene where she raised her hand. And, yeah. That's and really that funny. Was, that was really funny. But, yeah. um, do you mind if I go now with my, yeah. I mean, the, the other thing I'll say is just, I thought it was rel- relatively well structured how he, um, he brought out the dysfunction of this family. Yeah. Because they seem like this very, pres- like the Kennedys, you know, mm-hmm. like an East Coast powerful family, old money, lots mm-hmm. of power, and attempting to establish a political dynasty, which yeah. he actually uses that phrase in the movie. Um, <laughs> I thought that was all revealed very well and then, or established very well, and then it was revealed how dysfunctional they are. Yeah. Uh, through this rift in their family with these, these con men or this con man. Um, that was that was pretty well structured, and I appreciated those layers to the whole family overall. Um, and again, the acting, I, just, I, I really liked the acting a lot. So yeah, I thought Tom Bell was the standout for sure. Um, okay. I actually, I I actually thought that he didn't steal it, but he he carried it well. Like he carried that quirky character really mm-hmm. well. Um, he was actually he actually played the the equivalent character in the short film actually. Oh, okay. Um, and I was really <laughs> I was really excited about Ed Weeks because I'm a fanish of uh the uh, the Mindy Project. Oh, uh, is he on that? Yeah, he's he's one okay. of the co leads, I guess. He's a good looking uh, man. He is a very handsome gentleman. He's he's pretty. Yeah. Um, and I do want to mention that uh Dave Chen from from uh, Slash Filmcast, he tweeted that like this. I I really. I thought this was really funny. He tweeted after watching Leisure Class. He said, "Watching Leisure Class after Green Light is like seeing a good friend practice hard for a recital, then fall on their face during the solo." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Which, yeah, I I kind of agree. The movie didn't really work for me that well. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it like you said, Tiny. It I I really liked that the big dramatic moment. Um, was it was like it built toward it as if it was going to be the uh downfall or, or the the emotional crux, uh, crux of uh the brother characters but instead it turned out to be about the family and, yeah. and all of their just craziness and their demons and all that i mm-hmm. really really appreciated that yeah um and i really liked the i liked how uh leonard slash dean uh i liked that he was just basically a de- 
a destructive force for the wealthy family. Like yeah. it was kind of an anti one percenter kind of thing, mm-hmm. uh, or anti one percent kind of thing. Um, but I really I thought the script had so many problems. Yeah, I, it did. Yeah, like I like you said, I did not. I I did not. It, it was not clear, like in yeah. the beginning, like in having watched Project Greenlight, where they talk about the plot a little bit, and they they like they talk about how they're establishing plot and all that stuff like that. Um, I was still like, okay, well, okay, so why why doesn't Leonard like like William, and why why is there a rift between them? Why is he why is he there? Why is he why is he wreaking havoc? Like, there's yeah. a scene where yeah, like there's a scene where the butler comes in and he's like, someone has defecated on the Bentley. Yeah, and I'm like, at that point, I'm like. Wait, why did he take a shit on the Bentley? Yeah. I, don't, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't piece it together. So I just thought that it was really, really, uh, really strange and really peculiar the way that it was written. I didn't think it was written well at all. Um, and it sounds like, it sounds like a lot more of the comedy landed for you than it did for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I kind of, I thought it was okay. I thought that the, the comedy stylings of it was, was kind of okay, but it kind of, I wouldn't say overstate its welcome, but um, I think it was just so off-putting that I didn't know that I didn't know the clear motivations of all the characters. Because, mm-hmm. like, I didn't even know, uh, I didn't know, I didn't even know, like, I couldn't even tell if uh, if uh, Ed Weeks's character like actually genuinely loved Fiona, or right. if it was all a ruse, or or what. Like, it that was not communicated well at all no um and that kind of bugged me Mm -hmm. um yeah and i mean yeah and just and like you said i also couldn't couldn't really piece together what exactly william was up to like what what the actual what the actual through line of his of his arc of his (sighs) what his plan was Mm -hmm. um yeah, so I don't know. I I thought that it was I thought it was well done uh, enough uh visually at least and seeing the behind the scenes of it. Yeah. Um in the lead up to it kind of made it made it a little more uh made me respect it a little more uh, cuz I yeah. know like I knew the work that went into it to make it. Mm-hmm. Um but it's still there were some things that just didn't just didn't mesh well with me. Like, and according to project Greenlight, they were kind of rushed for time in the writing and the revising and everything, but it still just didn't like, it still felt just flat um, yeah, and yeah. uninspired really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I feel like when you do dark humor, you really have to establish your darkness, mm-hmm. if you will. Uh, and, and, and the movie just couldn't do that because there's too many silly hijinks comedy going on. Yeah. Like the, the, the scene we keep referring to with the climax in, in mm-hmm. the basement, that establishes the darkness because you have a powerful U.S. senator pointing a gun at people. And Is he a senator? He yeah, is a senator. He's a senator, yeah. yeah. Okay, see? Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So that you have this powerful, rich... It would be like, it'd be like, it'd be like Ted Kennedy... Mm-hmm pointing a gun at two dudes in his basement while he's drunk. I'm not entirely sure that that hasn't happened. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but Anyways, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, that, that's the equivalency of it. And I was like, holy, I was like, wow, this is crazy. Right. And then like we, we referenced that joke again where the, the, the prostitute just raises her <laughs> hand, you know, that's brilliant. Well, I don't know about brilliant, but very good situational dark <laughs> comedy. Brilliant for this movie. For this movie. Yeah. You establish, you establish that darkness and then you throw in this, out of left field, hilarious moment. Mm-hmm. That's what dark comedy is to me. I, I'm not an expert or anything, but that's what it is to me. And for this movie, there was that moment and maybe <laughs> one or two others, and everything else was just trying to blend it with silly hijinks, like a Fairly Brothers movie, uh, which yeah. just did, didn't mesh with those other scenes, in my opinion. It was it was really just a mess. Yeah, it was very. It it was not very focused at all. No, and no. a lot of the a lot of the plot elements kind of seemed more like, okay, well, we just need to get them to this point so that this can happen. And it was like, like there's a there's a there's a um, an escapade to uh to go to a party, and then that leads to them leaving the party, and then something happening that kind of propels them into the into the third act or into the latter half of the movie, mm-hmm. and. It just felt like, it felt like it, even, even scene by scene, like Ed Weeks' character and, and, and his fiance in the movie, 
uh, they have a scene together and then like the next scene that they're together in, it's a very strange, like kind of different dynamic Mm -hmm. and it wasn't very clear or it wasn't very, uh, cohesive. Uh, and it just kind of felt like more in service to the plot and to get them back on the road and back to the house basically. Right. Um, so there was some, there was a lot of script problems and I mean the movie had I watched, okay, had I watched this without Project Greenlight, without anything in context or anything like that, I'm, this would not have been a movie to review on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for sure. All right. But, uh, we're writing the coattails of Slash Filmcast. Um, yes, we are. By accident. So is there anything else we really need to say? Will this be gracing your DVD collection, Tiny? Oh, hell no. Blu-ray collection? Uh, hell no. <laughs> uh, not even pirated collection. <laughs> not that I really have one. But, right. uh, um, I, I'm disappointed in HBO films because they've put out <laughs> some really great stuff that I have just like championed to no end over mm. the past couple of years. Um, check our past episodes. Right. Um, I put one of their movies in my top 10 last year. Um, I think, or this year. Which one? Um, God, I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> um, geez. The, oh, uh, the normal heart. The normal heart. Thank you. Yeah. I knew it was something with heart. Right. The normal heart. I, one of the better movies I've seen in the past couple of years. I love that, and it's just unfortunate that this is kind of lumped into the same uh, subcategory. I don't know as as the leisure class. Yeah, it's just a bummer. Yeah. And I, I'll be very curious, and I do plan on going back and watching seasons one and two, and then watching Stolen Summer and The Battle of Shaker Heights mm-hmm. to see how it to see how they match up. Because my memory of The Battle of Shaker Heights is that it was it was a it was a very well done or fairly well done uh, uh, coming of age story, and I don't think that it like my memory of it is not nearly as bad as my uh, experience watching the Leisure Class. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of curious how that and I've never seen Stolen Summer so yeah I, I wanted to keep going though I'd like to keep to keep doing the show keep running this experiment because I think something great could happen from it it's got a lot of potential yeah and I I love I love it as a concept um mm-hmm. for sure and um also Stars has a show called The Chair that I've heard a lot about which I th- I don't know the specifics of it I think it's essentially the same thing only uh. I don't, I don't know if it's essentially the same thing, but I know it's a competition, um, about filmmaking. So I'm going to check that out and I'll report back in a later episode. But, um, I, I meant to look up and see if they have plans for season five of Project Greenlight. Cause this was, this was their first season in 10 years. Wow. Um, yeah. Cause they, this was like their revival season. So, dang. Yeah. So I don't know. Between that diversity controversy thing, say that <laughs> five times fast. Um, but between that and uh the leisure class like not doing well no um like it's rated as a 4.0 on IMDb right now yeah um between that i don't i mean i it would be i'd be curious to see if they do do another one cuz a lot of the a lot of the critics and stuff have, have like there was one i don't remember where it was but um there was one up there there was one review that just <laughs> uh said uh project greenlight is 0 for 4 with the leisure class <laughs> uh yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, but I do, I do think that it's a great, a great showcase. And I mean, some of the, like some of the short films that I, that I saw from, uh, from it, uh, like those are like people that I'll, I'll be very curious to see what they do in, in the future. Yeah. Um, and I've liked a couple of their Facebook pages. Nice. Um, so I'm going to definitely check that out. Um, or hopefully they'll do something in the future. Cool. Um, I think that about, does it for this week's topic, doesn't it? I think so. Yeah. Um, Let's put this to bed. All right. Well, um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's our topic for the week. And we're going to go ahead and transition to potpourri, Tiny. Yep. Uh, which, for first-time listeners, potpourri is the section of the podcast where we talk about whatever we want as long as it smells good. Basically, anything that we've watched lately, anything that we're looking forward to, any news or anything like that. So it's just basically a potpourri of, of topics and everything. And I think I, I have two things in tiny. You have one and an anecdote. So why don't you kick us off? Yeah. Uh, the the anecdote I thought I'd share with our listeners because I was like really proud of this. <laughs> um, I My girlfriend and I went to a Halloween party, and it was uh, – close to her hometown uh-huh um and so we stayed with her parents all weekend and um they 
just got a, a brand new 60 inch 4K television. Nice. Freaking unbelievable. Like I'm putting away pennies right now to get one. It's so <laughs> such a cool TV. Um, and so yeah, we were up there on Saturday. So we were watching some college football. Sports is a great way to test out. Uh, watching a sports game is a great way to test out how, the capabilities of a television. Right. So we watched some of that, but then like we, we, a bunch of the good teams had a bye week, so there wasn't really that much good football on. So we ended up switching to some movie channels, mm-hmm. and we came across Titanic. Okay. And she like loved that movie when she was a kid, just like a lot of young girls did. Right. Um. And, and I I like that movie. I know you have your qualms with it, and you don't like you don't really like uh, James Cameron and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I, brief tangent, and we'll get back to you. <laughs> I did say at one point. I think I said jokingly or, or aggressively in an early episode of the podcast. I referred to James Cameron as a hack. Yeah, he did. Which, yeah, that's not accurate. No, <laughs> I, uh, he, I respect his, his contributions to filmmaking. And while I don't appreciate his storytelling quite that much, I do recognize that he is a very, uh, influential and talented filmmaker. Okay. Right. Um, on. yeah. Right so anyway, anyway. See, I, I liked, I liked Titanic too. I've, I was a fan of it as a kid. I still think it's a movie to watch. Um, <laughs> so we, we ended up just watching the whole movie. And so. My girlfriend had this line basically as we were, cause we were, we both seen it so many times. We were basically just kind of poking fun at it mm-hmm. and like, and like making fun at the silly love story and stuff like that. That and happens so, over like two days and she can't trust. She, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we, we were just having fun with it. And so we get to the part where, you know, they make love for the first time. Mm-hmm. And if you remember, it's in the like cargo hold of the ship and they actually, do it in a car that's in the cargo. You know, get oh, the hand, I remember. Tiny. The, the, the windows are all steamed up and you get the handprint. Classic, classic. Yes. And so <laughs> right before that scene, they're in the car and and I'm just like, you know, like I said, we were joking around. I was like, they're going to do it. <laughs> and she she says this line and I was like, I love her. She <laughs> goes, she goes, yeah, they've got f- in their eyes. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Good God. I was just like, it was so out of left field. Oh, wow. It was so funny. Like, I just, <laughs> we had to, like, pause the movie because I was laughing so hard. Jesus. Just the way she said it. <laughs> Sorry for cursing, but. No, it's fine. Yeah, I'll be uh, having bleeping out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so funny. I was, was so good. proud. <laughs> Jeez. So that's my little anecdote. Nice. Well, uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll clean it up a little bit with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why? uh, I don't know, but, uh, my first potpourri se- segment is, uh, <laughs> about a movie with two characters who had <laughs> in their eyes. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's a movie called two night stand. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Are you familiar with this movie at all? I am not. Okay. So, uh, yay upon like a year, year, year and a half ago, uh, I remember seeing on IMDb like a, a trailer for Two Night Stand and mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't like click it or anything, but I looked at, or I didn't watch the trailer, but I remember reading the synopsis and it's basically, um, <laughs> Tiny, you know my tastes. So you'll, uh, you'll, I'm curious to see your reaction when I, when I say this. So. Okay. Basically, it's a movie starring Miles Teller and Anna Lee Tipton uh-huh. as a man and woman who uh, have a one night stand, and then when they wake up the next morning, they find out they're snowed in. <laughs> so, oh my god! So they're stuck there. Wow. So it's a rom com. Yeah. And it follows it follows kind of the tropes and kind of follows the formula of a standard rom com. But and I, it's worth mentioning that today is. Uh, November 9th is actually Anna Lee Tipton, Tipton's birthday. Um, Happy birthday, Anna. Yeah. You'll never She's listen to this. She's one of our this. listeners. She will never listen to this. Um, <laughs> but the movie was actually really, really fantastic. Nice. Like, I really, really enjoyed it. And I <laughs> think that people might judge me for that. Nice. <laughs> like, it's... like I, um. So, basically, it's... An, it's a really it's a really well constructed uh romance story between these two characters because these mm-hmm. two characters these two characters meet they each like it's i don't know how else to describe it other than the day that they spend together uh the day after they've hooked up um 
in a, in a one night stand scenario, like they each have their their baggage and everything. Uh, his isn't really revealed until later in the movie, but we're introduced to Annalee Tipton's character Megan um, as someone who has uh, gone through a breakup. Who uh, her fiance and her and she broke up, and she's been uh, kind of just mopey about that for like a year or something like that. So she decides to go online, uh, create a profile, and then. Uh, hook up with a guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the, the setup of the, of the plot and everything. And like little flourishes that made me think like, Oh, this is going to be, this is going to be actually really good. Um, mm-hmm. happened in their first interactions online. Uh, cause it kind of does the, the standard like, uh, like she, she types on her computer and then it pops up on the screen for the viewer to see. And it's like, it, it, she, <laughs> It's kind of a quirky, like, like, oh, I'm going to say this. Uh, like, uh, she says at one point, like, she types out, do you want to have sex with me? And then she says, like, she erases it and she's like, no, that makes me sound like a robot. <laughs> and like, they have like a very brief, like, back and forth. And like, it's a, it's a nice, like, witty banter kind of thing. And it's just, it's like, it, like, that's when I knew, like, like the, uh, the way that the humor of that's, of that happened. Like, uh, he gives her his address and then, uh, she's like, do you mind if we video chat? So I make sure that you're not, uh, it's not a murder done or something like that. And then <laughs> like he responds with, uh, sure. Let me just take off my mom's dress. <laughs> and like, and it's all just on screen, like and, and typed out. And I'm like, yeah. this is, this is, this could lead to something really nice. And it really does. Like there's, uh, their entire day together where they, where they spend the next day is filled with, just sequences of them bonding and kind of the, uh, it really sold the chemistry of the two, of the two leads and, and it really sold the, uh, budding relationship between the two characters. And like, there's one, there's a really wonderful scene. Like I actually stopped, I actually paused it and then tweeted out that, uh, like tweeted that it was a really strong movie and all this stuff. Um, cause there's a really great scene about in the midway point of the movie where, uh, they're both, <laughs> they're both in like a makeshift fort. Um, with like bed sheets and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. And there, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, sw- I swear it's a good movie, Tiny. <laughs> I, I bet it is. Yeah. And they're, uh, they're kind of, they're listening to music and they're eating snacks and stuff like that and they're talking. And then a song comes on and it's like, I mean, I think I may have fallen in love with Annalie Tipton in the nice. scene. Yeah. Cause she kind of gives him these, these like doe eyes and, uh, or, or she, not even, she doesn't even give that. She starts kind of like not, uh, nodding her head and stuff like that. And then, uh, she's like, she says, um, you, you don't want to play this song. And he's like, uh, why not? And then she's like, because I love it. And, uh-huh. uh, and then she gives him the doe eyes. And then, uh, he's, uh, she says like, if you play it, I'm going to dance and, and you, you can't see me dance because <laughs> it'll destroy you or something like, something like that. Yeah. And it's really, it's really well shot and well edited because she starts dancing outside the fort and he just sees like, like not really a silhouette, but like he turns, like he turns the light a little bit so that, like down a little bit so he can see like through or, or up a little bit. I'm not, I can't remember because mm-hmm. I'm dumb. Um, <laughs> but it's like just the way it's like it conveys really well, like the emotion of the scene. And hmm. it, from there it's, it goes into some interesting avenues. They, they have some interesting discussions and all that stuff. And it's, it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm such a sucker for this kind of movie. Like yeah. I heaped praise upon, uh, sleeping with other people, which was another rom-com that, uh, this one, that one came out this year. And I, I, I stand by that review. It basically, I still think it's this generation's, uh, uh, when Harry met Sally, mm-hmm. but, but, uh, uh, two night stand is not quite that caliber, but it is, uh, definitely a strong, a strong movie, uh, that I really, really enjoyed. It kind of, it kind of gets a little wobbly in the, in the last act, like the, the kind of, I mean, it follows the kind of standard rom-com formula, which it's hard to break out of that anyway, unless you're, uh, uh, was it Mark Webb who did 500 days of summer? I believe so. Yeah. Um, which I need to watch that again, but anyway, um, uh, for context for me and rom-coms, I watched, uh, 500 days of summer. Like that was my most watched movie like two years ago. Yeah. Like I watched it like on average, like probably, seven or eight times mm-hmm. the whole year. But anyway, it's a great movie. Oh my God. It's so good. I liked it very much. It's amazing. But anyway, so two night stand, it kind of leads to a, to the kind of the resolution of some of the conflict at the end is like, I'm, I didn't buy it. Like I didn't mm-hmm. buy the, I didn't buy that characters would behave in a certain way, but 
I was sold so hard on the relationship between the two that I was able to forgive that shortcoming in the in the in the final moments of the okay. movie. Um, so with that slight blemish, I still thought it was a really strong movie, and uh, yeah, and I believe that our friends at the nerds uh, the the nerds you're looking for podcast, I think they may have trashed it like a, oh really a few maybe a few months ago. I can't remember. Well, um, so I have a question. So they're snowed uh, in. They're snowed in elaborate on so is it like they physically can't open the door to the home or it's like yes they they're in an apartment okay and uh imagine it like my apartment tiny like okay um say i don't have this balcony okay and like the one door to my building uh like that's the basic setup of of that like that that structure of that they he's on the second floor he get, they go downstairs. The one the one door to it is like it's iced over basically. Okay. And they just they can't get through it. And then it's mm-hmm. a it's a massive snow snow apocalypse kind of scenario. So okay. it just builds upon that. So like they they can't they physically can't leave. Okay. I was gonna say yeah. this is. I was like, she can't just trek through some snow and get a cab or something. No, no, okay. no. It's they're physically trapped. Gotcha. Inside. Okay, that seemed like yeah. a bit of a weak link to me. But, right. Okay. Tiny is the uh, resident. Uh, he's he's not a he's not a wimp when it comes to snow. No, so I'm not. He has some. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to impress him. <laughs> yeah. It's hard, it's hard to uh, get him to buy into. It'd be hard to snow me in. I'll put it that right. way. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> I have a. I have a rear wheel drive car. I need to get my tires changed. Anyway, oh, um, bummer. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. So what, I think it sounds. I'd like to see it. I think it sounds good. It I is mean, currently on HBO Go slash HBO Now. Love me some Miles so, Teller and some Annalee Tipton. Me so. too. Stay away from her. Me too. <laughs> I'm um, taking Maddie. Right. <laughs> wow. Um. But yeah, and and they're they're both so charming in the movie. It's nice. uh, it's really it's really good. I I I got. I really enjoyed it. Cool. Um, so, Tiny, your uh, next slash first thing. Yes. Uh, for Potpourri this week, I have uh, the soon-to-be perennial classic San Andreas. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I decided to watch it just because I was in one of those moods. Like, let's just put on some... I want to see some <laughs> fall over and right. some stuff crumble. And I want to see the rock flex. And I want to see him be un, unrealistically sweaty. I don't know. <laughs> is he is he dripping with sp- no? Sp- he's ah, not. Damn it! And really, they did not like emphasize his physique as a as a physical beast of a man. Um, That's right. Doesn't he play like a kind of everyman helicopter pilot or something like that? Sorta. I mean, he doesn't do any. He for the most part doesn't do any like ridiculous feats of strength or mm-hmm. you know just he he's not uh he's not his character from the fast franchise okay um so uh, anyways i i was just in the mood for one of those kinds of movies um and uh, i just went ahead and rented it from uh uverse uh which is my cable provider um and uh i, I had very low expectations going in because i mean it just looked like a uh uh, Roland Emmerich movie, mm-hmm. you know, and, and like uh, I was like, I it, it's probably going to be terrible, but uh, whatever. Um, so I watched it, and it, it was pretty much what I expected. It was not. Um, th- there's nothing really special about the movie. Um, <laughs> it's it's pretty much exactly what you expect. There's a bunch of earthquakes. It's a pretty, from what I understand, a scientifically uh, inaccurate um, <laughs> uh, depiction of geology. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> But I don't. I don't know. Maybe it could happen. Uh, whatever. Um, essentially, there's like a ton of earthquakes all in a row that follow the San Andreas Fault, and uh, it it affects L.A., Southern California, all of all of the eastern branch of. Or I'm sorry, the western branch of California, really, mm-hmm. over where it just happens to be all the major cities are. Um, and it's 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 just a very Hollywood kind of movie. Um, they re- they make all these California references that like people like us here in Indianapolis we don't get. You know, it's like <laughs> oh we're, we're we're all the way up to Bakersfield now. I'm like where the hell is Bakersfield? Is that a, what is that? Um, yeah, and it's, it's it's so it's very Hollywood in that respect. There's tons of uh, tons of green screen mm. CGI stuff, which I give them a lot of respect because the, the actual destruction was pretty cool to watch. Mm. Um, again, as unrealistic as it is, I mean, it's literally like they're playing, they're in a helicopter and they're playing slalom with like falling buildings and stuff, wow. which I, I mean, I don't know, maybe a 9.5 
earthquake would actually do that, but it just mm-hmm. seemed a little ridiculous to me. <laughs> um, hashtag physics. <laughs> so, you know, and, and it's just, a, it's just a classic scenario. It's a father who's estranged from his daughter and ex-wife and some crazy event happens and it brings them back together and they're trying to save each other. It's, it's just a classic scenario. Right. Um, it's so there's nothing really that special about the movie to set it apart from other, from other destruction, semi apocalyptic type movies like this. Um, it's just, it's just like 2012 or day after tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not a very unique movie. Um, I will give it credit for the female lead, um, played by Alexander Daddario. Does she do a good job acting? She does. Yeah, yeah. she's she's okay. fine. Uh, I, I give the movie credit because she is not a stupid bimboy damsel in distress. Nice. She actually has some knowledge and uses some of that knowledge to help save herself. Um, she actually saves some other people. Like she's she's a bit of a heroine herself. Mm-hmm. Um, she just happens to be stranded and needs help to get out. So I, I give it respect for that. But there's just, I mean, there's there's so many gratuitous shots of her cleavage, and she's clearly just. Uh, they they clearly were like, what is the most sex appeal actress we can possibly get for this <laughs> role? And that's what she was. Not to say that she lacks no talent, because I think she's actually a, a pretty a pretty good actress. Mm-hmm. Um, but they they emphasized her uh, attractiveness in the film, which I don't I'm mind. Right, right, right. <laughs> Not to say it's a bad thing. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, it's it's a ploy, and it's yeah. really uh, it 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 tells you what kind of movie they were going for. Right, They're, and it sounds like it's a it's good that they while doing that and accentuate and accentuating her attractiveness like they still had a character who was able to not right. be a stereotype or anything but like it was that. stereotypical in pretty much every other way though really? the, the the dialogue was just a, was really bad Jeez. just so such standard standard dialogue um, <laughs> it was it was pretty dumb but you know if that's what you're looking for if you're looking for one of those kinds of movies it serves that purpose it's it, it, it was fun enough do you think you would have gotten more enjoyment out of it if you would have seen it in the theater? No. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. No. Carla Gugino played the mother as well. Oh, um, okay. And she was okay. It's a little, you know, you hear a lot of, um, it's kind of a controversy now. So many female actresses are coming out and saying there's just almost no good parts for women in Hollywood. Right. And, I mean, this movie demonstrates that a little bit. Like I said, the the main heroine was actually a bit of a heroine and she wasn't just some damsel in distress so i give him credit for that but at the same mm-hmm. time it's like she's wearing a tank top the entire movie and yeah she you know there's a tsunami so she gets wet it's you know it's like it's just right it's blatant it's blatant uh Oof. objectifying objectivism right. i don't know how to say it but yeah so yeah it's it, it was san andreas okay yeah yeah probably the poster the poster actress for uh uh lack of female leads is uh Judy Greer this year was in like three movies where she played essentially the exact same role. Really? Yeah. Ant-Man, Jurassic World, and one more. I want to say Tomorrowland. She just played a mother, uh, yeah. who was like just completely just not ineffectual in, in the entire, <laughs> in each movie. Like it was really obscene. Um, <laughs> right. Dang. Yeah. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. And she's such a, te- like Judy Greer is amazing. Oh, I love her. Yeah. She's great. Um, yeah, so I'm worried that maybe she might be like upset over that and then she'll yeah. like go to Hollywood and or like go up to like the representation of Hollywood and be like ah, that's such a long walk for a dumb dumb reference. <laughs> uh I'm <laughs> I can't even remember the exact vernacular. Damn it. Um so take a look cuz it's the last time <laughs> we'll see these. That's yeah. Anyway. Nice. Yeah, I think uh, Naomi Watts may have said something about like once you hit forty, mm-hmm. the only role you're going to play is like a mother. Yeah, like yeah. that's it. And like, it's, it's unfortunate because yeah. you know guys hit forty, and The Rock is in his forties, and he's playing mm-hmm. a big action star still. Right. It's it's, it's Liam very, Neeson. Liam Neeson. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's it really is a shame. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so get out there, girls. Write some. Right. Write some strong female parts. Right. Hollywood in general. Do yeah. That. Get your yeah. together. Yeah. So um, yeah. That was San Andreas. Yeah. Cool. Um, last up for me. This will be brief because I've only seen like three episodes of it. But mm-hmm. uh, the latest season of Agents of Shield. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's fun. It's it's you know it's doing it for me. It um, 
it ended with a, a cliffhanger and se- not really a cliffhanger, but a, a big thing in season two happened um, that propels it into season three. And what I'm really enjoying about it, one of the big, one of the big issues I had with season two is that uh, they introduced the inhumans, like just as a concept of, of like cool super powered alien people kind of thing. Um, and the whole time they were doing that, I was like, are, why, why are they putting such a focus on inhumans when like the inhumans movie is years down the line. I think now there's rumors that they're going to cancel it anyway and replace it with something else. Wow. Um, but I was just thinking like, are they like, they can't do anything substantial with the inhumans cause their movie is going to be coming out eventually and it'll be its own thing. And they're not going to be reliant on set up or characters that were established in agents of shield. So I don't, didn't see why they were doing it, mm-hmm. but the way that they ended season two is they, they did something that really brought it to a bigger scale and they've been running with that in season three, and I'm I'm really digging it uh, quite a bit. It's it's an it's an interesting way that the show has separated itself from the greater Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh-huh. and uh, it's kind of doing its own thing. And of course, when uh, uh, Captain America: Civil War comes out, it'll it'll be affected by that, and it'll it'll have to do that. But I really like the way that the show is kind of coming to its own as its own series. Nice. Um, yeah. So I've I've been digging that, and also. Chloe Bennett and uh, Adrian Palicki are both in it, and they're nice. very attractive. After we just talked about lack of female roles and strong <laughs> characters and stuff like that, um, I'm objectifying them. Amazing. I like that character because she's hot. Yeah. No, they are actually very, uh, very strong characters. Nice and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and also there's uh, some good puns. Nice. Because right? Clark Gregg is amazing. Yeah, uh, he's pretty great. Yeah, I think he popped up in our. TV dads episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cause he's not, he's a surrogate dad basically to, right. the, to the team. But, and that's kind of another thing in those three episodes. I've, I've noticed kind of a, a lack of team based stuff. Like they're, they're not really scattered. They're all a functioning team. Uh, the core characters, but it's, it, I don't get the feel of them being a unified team so much as, as these characters are, are following their own arcs in a, in, in a way as still a cohesive unit, but I, I haven't gotten enough, um, enough like team things, which was what hooked me in season one was at the, at the crucial moment in season one, late in season one, uh, that, uh, when basically when, um, uh, uh, Captain America, the winter soldier came out, it changed shield, obviously. So mm-hmm. agents of shield changed accordingly. And that kind of put the entire team on like the, and on the outs with shield and with, uh, with the government. So they were kind of bonded together as a ragtag team to do their own thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was like really impressive. And it feels like between then and now in season three, that was season one. Um, it kind of feels like they've lost like that kind of energy. Um, so I'm hoping mm. that they can find that and bring it back. Cool. Um, yeah. So that's Agents of Shield on ABC. It's also on Hulu, which only has like the five recent episodes on Hulu. So okay. Yeah. So I've been trying to make sure I don't get too far behind. Nice. Um, yeah. And that um, yeah, that about does it for this week's episode. But Tiny. Yeah. We need to we need to figure out next week. We do. Yeah. This is something I've been trying to like. It's been a conscious effort. Um for for me to for for us to do this to kind of tease out what we're going to talk about next week so Mm -hmm. uh since we did a couple when was that like three or four episodes ago yeah something like that yeah something like that we did uh netflix picks Mm -hmm. which basically we uh picked a number and we each watched the movie or title that was on our netflix queue in that position last time we did that was um we did we watched the source family and the crow um, mm-hmm. and we reviewed that for the episode and I was actually pretty proud of that episode. Um, it was actually episode 133. So OV 133 from October 15th, but so it's been a month and we're going to do it again. Nice. Um, yeah. And we, ch- <laughs> uh, we changed it around, um, because <laughs> tiny here has a proclivity for documentaries. I do. I do. And I didn't really want to watch the source family last time. So, to change it up, what we did was we picked three numbers. We, I gave Tiny a number, he gave me a number, and then we added those, <laughs> those numbers together. And so we and put the, the sum of that as our third number. So mm-hmm. the number that you gave was 52 and I gave 57. And then the sum of that was 109. So right. we picked those three titles from our respective cues. And what we're going to do is we're going to introduce them and then we're going to pick which one 
the other one is going to watch, if that makes sense. Did I say that co- clearly enough? Yes. Okay. The thing is, I know nothing about the three movies that are in mine. Well, <laughs> next to nothing. Well, Tiny, I have a present for you. I uh, I got the IMDb summaries for each one. Nice. All, 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 uh, all out here. So you can introduce yours. Okay. And then, yeah. Okay. So my three movies are, uh, the first one is The Guest, which I believe Mike talked about at one point. I think I may have as well. Was he? Yeah. yeah. So you guys said it was good. Um, and I added it to my queue and kind of forgot about it. But, uh, it's, uh, the synopsis is, uh, a soldier introduces himself to the Peterson family, claiming to be a friend of their son who died in action. After the young man is welcomed into their home, a series of accidental deaths seem to be connected to his presence. Yes. So it sounds like a fun, eerie, uh, uh, horror-ish movie. Mm-hmm. So that sounds fun. Starring Dan Stevens and uh, Mika Monroe from... She was in It Follows, and I guess he was in, like... He, was he in Downton Abbey? I do not know either of those people. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't yeah. know those names. Mika Monroe was the female lead in uh, It Follows. Okay, yeah. okay. I liked her in that, so... Yeah. so. Um, the other two, Shocker, are documentaries. They are, aren't they? <laughs> they are. Which is seriously, it's unintentional. I just have a <laughs> buttload of them in my queue. Um, the first one is called Mile, Mile and a Half. Uh, it's a documentary from 2013. Um, in an epic snow year, five friends leave their daily lives behind to hike California's historic John Muir Trail, a 211 mile stretch from Yosemite to Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the contiguous United States. Their goal, complete the journey in 25 days while capturing the amazing sights and sounds they encounter along the way. Inspired by their bond, humor, artistry, and dedication, the group continues to grow to include other artists, musicians, and adventure seekers. Before they all reach the summit, hikers and viewers alike affirm the old adage, it's about the journey, not the destination. Mile, Mile and a Half is is the feature-length documentary of a journey, of that journey. So, Interesting. I thought that sounded kind of fun. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And then the last one, again, a documentary uh, called Bite Size from 2014. Uh, Bite Size tells the stories of four kids around the country as they embark on a journey to become healthier and lose weight. All it takes is someone to believe in you and the will to try. So, yeah, it's kind of about the um, obesity epidemic and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So Sounds like a focus on childhood obesity, too. Yeah, childhood obesity. Yeah. So Cool. Yeah. Um, and then I'll go ahead and name mine, and then we can go ahead and pick ours. Okay. Um, okay, so my three were... The Inbetweeners from 2011. Uh, it's based on the British TV series of the same name. It's uh, about four socially troubled 18-year-olds from the south of England who go on holiday to Melia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've actually heard about the show. It sounds it sounds interesting, but this is the movie. But yeah, um, and then VHS Viral, which is uh, the third entry in the VHS franchise, the right. anthology horror series. Um, I broke down like the list of directors that were listed and some of them are actually pretty interesting. Um, hmm. uh, the one that sticks out is Nacho, v- uh, uh, Vigilando, uh, who did time crimes. One of my favorite nice. time travel movies. It's a great movie. Yeah. Uh, he also did open windows with, uh, Elijah Wood and Sasha Gray, uh, oh. which I think Elijah Wood was just on the Nerdist talking about that recently. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so I've seen the first two v- VHSs and been kind of mixed on both of them. So we'll see. And then the third one is Bernie, which I've heard a lot of good things about, starring Jack Black and Shirley MacLaine. Uh, in a small, in, uh, in small town Texas, an affable, uh, mortician strikes up a friendship with a wealthy widow, though when she starts to become controlling, he gro- he goes to great lengths to separate himself from her grasp. So those are our three picks, and, uh, Tiny, which one do you think I should watch? Um, I'm going to go with Bernie. Okay. Cause nice. I, I have it in my queue as well and I've been meaning to watch it. Nice. Um, and I thought it's uh, seeing the previews. I thought the cast was just awesome and it looks like it had this really fun, quirky style to it and mm-hmm. sounds funny and awesome. So I'm going to go with Bernie. Nice. And, and I'm glad that you picked that one for me because, um, uh, Jack Black was just recently on again, the Nerdist. Um, and I have such a weird, a weird relationship with Jack Black. I, I'm not, mm. I wouldn't call myself a fan. I've always kind of find him, found him a, a little bit overbearing. Yeah. Um, but I haven't really watched much of his stuff and I've heard a lot of really good things about, uh, uh, Bernie. So, and so my pick for you to watch tiny, uh, 
This is a tough one. Two documentaries or... Yeah. uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick The Guest, (laughs) um, which I'm actually really excited for you to watch because I really really enjoyed that movie. Um, Yeah. Uh, And it's also from uh, the... It's from director Adam Wingard, who also did... uh, What was that movie called? I know... uh, You're Next. Okay. Uh, Did you ever see that? Yeah, I talked about it on here. Yeah, okay. I was the dissenter. I didn't... I thought it was okay. Nice. Yeah, I wasn't. Oh, this will be interesting then. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's 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 our picks for next week. Next week we will be reviewing Bernie and the guest. And uh, I'll just I'll go ahead and throw this curveball out here. But if you're listening to this before Monday, November sixteenth, and you would like to hear at least me review either the Inbetweeners or VHS Viral for my potpourri section. Uh, tweet me at obsessive viewer or check, uh, check in on the Facebook page at, uh, facebook.com slash the obsessive viewer and let me know and I'll watch whichever one you guys pick if you guys are listening or if anyone responds. Um, Fekus, I assume that you'll, uh, reach out to me. So hopefully we'll get one, one, uh, <laughs> reply. But yeah, yeah, just, uh, that'll be my potpourri for the section for this, for that episode is either VHS viral or the inbetweeners, uh, <laughs> depending on our listener feedback, which hopefully actually happens. That'd be awesome. Um, that would be very awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, other than that, and also Pat, you should, you should definitely, uh, contact me too. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll just go through all the people that we know listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, AKA our friends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, then I think that about does it. Um, yeah. Is there anything else we need to discuss? I think that's it. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening guys. And we will be back next week with Bernie and the guest. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. which became Stolen Summer, which I think had uh, Kevin... Uh, um, wow, what is his name? Um, Kevin Connolly? No. No. <laughs> no. Um, uh, is Kevin it Kevin? Kevin James? No. Uh, the, uh, he does... Uh, oh, my God. I can't read House Arrest. Um, <laughs> Andrew Kevin. Usual... Kevin Pollock? Kevin Pollock. There you go. Nice. Yeah. House Arrest. Why did I say... Anyway. Um, <laughs> that's... I was about to say Andrew Kevin Walker. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so then season two. Thank you for listening to The Obsessive Viewer, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find more of our episodes at ovpodcast.com, and you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast app. The Obsessive Viewer's theme song is An Eclipse of Events and is provided by Loud Like from their EP Mistakes We Must Make. You can find that and more great music from them on iTunes and like their Facebook page at facebook.com slash loudlikemusic. Any and all feedback on the podcast is encouraged. You can email the hosts individually at matt, tiny, or mike at obsessiveviewer.com or send an email to the podcast in general at podcast at obsessiveviewer.com. Check out the Obsessive Viewer blog at obsessiveviewer.com where we post movie and TV reviews and the occasional editorial about the business of entertainment. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the obsessive viewer and follow us on Twitter at obsessive viewer at obsessive tiny and at I am Mike white. If you want more obsessive content in your life, check out our sister site, obsessivebooknerd.com for book reviews, author spotlights, and a general celebration of reading. Finally, if you're philosophically curious, check out Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com and subscribe to the podcast on the podcatcher of your choice. Again, thank you so much for listening. We love you. Be excellent to each other.